that's me, developer advocate Google. I work in the NGRX project as well. Uh, NGRX is a reactive thing. We use RxJS heavily in, in AngularJS and, or in Angular. NGRX is a kind of library around that. It's me on GitHub. It's me on Twitter. You can find me in those places. So Angular, you guys all know what it is. So again, we went from AngularJS, this kind of sort of organically grown framework. And when we, when we went to rethink it, we kind of call it a platform now. And what, what I mean by that is that Angular was just a script you dropped into the page, right? You could use it. That was great. Angular 2 plus is a little bit different. We've kind of thought about this as more of a platform, I think, in the same way that Microsoft thinks about SPFX and SharePoint as a platform, right? We don't want to give you the exact way to do things. We don't want to say this is the only way we can use Angular. We want to give you a set of kind of really powerful libraries and tools and these sorts of things, right, to build these environments that can scale from kind of the simplest case to, you know, some of the largest applications that we have at Google. Um, but we started really at the, the kind of largest applications at Google end, right? And so, you know, we put all this stuff in. We've got forms and routing and HTTP and internationalization and cool animations. And then kind of the tooling side, right? The CLI, Angular CLI does this really well. Um, IDE support, kind of deep integration with stuff like code. We get that from TypeScript for free most of the time. Uh, progressive web apps, which are a whole different sort of kind of ideas. And then we've started recently kind of going back. Now that we've got a stable platform, we're pretty happy with the public API. We're pretty happy with what we can do. We've got a lot of feedback that says, okay, cool. We like using Angular, but We'd like to be able to use it elsewhere, right? We would use it in a way that is not this kind of big single page monolithic application case. And so actually, a year ago, I think, we were up in, in Redmond uh, at the Microsoft offices. We meet with the TypeScript team kind of once a month. We work really closely together. But while we were up there, we got invited to a, ver a variety of different meetings, uh, some of them with the Visual Studio team, with the Code team, and with the SharePoint team. And we really uh, kind of had a deep dive onto how they were building SPFX, how it was kind of fitting together. And I think we saw that that was something that we certainly wanted to be part of. Obviously, we got a lot of feedback from, from sort of Microsoft developers who really like using Angular. There's a lot kind of in common there. But we thought at that point that really we couldn't kind of do a good job of it. We, we knew that in the way that we were optimized, the way we were set up, we weren't going to be able to do it sort of properly, right? And so we, we didn't do anything about it at that point, but it certainly uh, kind of immediately landed in the back of our brains. And as we started to, to rethink these things in Angular, the SPFX case was something that we kind of really wanted to test, right? And so we built all this stuff. This is why we have, this is why we make Angular, right? Bug tracking and all these things that I mentioned in the keynote. Um, but really we have this other team that builds material, right? So we have this kind of first party stuff. We have our material team who build Angular material. Uh, one of the things they've been doing is, you know, we realize that not everybody has the same design tastes as Google. Material is great, but not everybody wants to use it, especially in kind of a Microsoft world. So we've been working on this idea of the Angular CDK, and we call that the de Component Development Kit. So getting components, getting widgets, getting web parts, whatever, right, is pretty hard in terms of, you know, accessibility and testability and all these things. And like, if you're building a really high performance table view or a grid view or a calendar or a date picker, it would be nice if you didn't have to kind of re-implement the whole world from scratch, right? And so our team has done a lot of work to make material great, but we want to be able to leverage all that work so that you can kind of style your own stuff. So, you know, things like NG Office UI Fabric, when we go look at this for Angular 2 Plus, we can use the CDK, right? So we give you these really powerful underpinnings that handle all of the stuff like accessibility and all of that stuff, and then you can really style it, reskin it for yourself. And that's a big part of kind of the, the future looking story. And of course, we have this entire like, ecosystem of components, right? There are dozens of them out there. These are some of the big ones. Clarity comes from VMware. The NG Bootstrap team is open source, things like Kendo, right? It would be great if all of these things could be used sort of outside of you know, these big kind of monolithic applications. And from a business point of view, it would be super nice if these teams could build their stuff, sell their stuff to a much larger audience than just Angular developers, right? So this is the kind of thing we started to think about. Uh, this is one of the big ones we build at Google, right? So PLX, which is this kind of business intelligence platform that we build. All of these things are kind of built in this kind of widgety fashion, right? Where you want to have the ability to kind of bring in data and then kind of assemble something very much like SharePoint, right? And we have these sort of parts, these widgets that we want to bring in. So we've been talking to the PLX team about this. Google Cloud Platform is the same way. I'll probably get in trouble for showing you this slide. But Google Platform, right, is the, the kind of our Azure. And again, this is actually an Angular JS application. Uh, it's been around for a long time, and they've been incrementally upgraded to, to Angular. But of course, again, they want to be able to have functionality that comes from other teams, plug these things together, right? So these teams internally are asking these questions as well. And then of all these people that are out in the world using Angular in production, right? So that top left the Azure functions kind of panels written in Angular, obviously cloud, a bunch of stuff. But most of these, again, are using 
kind of Angular in this SPA mode, but almost all of them are saying to us, hey, it would be really cool if we could use bits and pieces of Angular. Again, we want to be more flexible. Maybe they're doing server-side rendering. Maybe they've got kind of a, you know, a sort of public-facing website that you don't want to do as an SPA. And all of these cases keep coming back to us and saying, hey, we'd really like you to think about the other ways you could use Angular. So we've been listening, right? And of course, we have our meetups that do this. And of course, we have all of these, these amazing Angular developers who are coming to us and saying, look, we like the SPA case, but the world is changing, right? It's not always going to be SPA as we want to use it in different places. So they keep asking us questions. We keep listening. And then maybe some of you people know these two. So Ward Bell and John Papa. John runs you know, Azure's kind of DevRel. Ward's a long time Microsoft dev. And we work really closely with these guys, right? And again, they're giving us feedback that says, hey, there's all this other interesting stuff happening outside of the kind of Google space, right? And outside of the kind of hipster open source world, right? There are, there are people who would like to use some of this stuff in some of these environments that you haven't thought about. So this is what kind of we went down this path. And we, we kind of started this new project, Angular Labs. Uh, one of the things we've been very, very careful about with Angular is that when we made this big jump from AngularJS to Angular, quite frankly, we made a lot of people really mad, right? This wasn't a, it wasn't a, an amazing thing to have to do to everybody to think about rewriting. And so when we thought about Angular, we wanted to make sure that, A, you know, we had this stable, predictable, kind of future-facing way of looking at things. Really, the main goal of Angular for us is you should be able to write Angular code today that works you know, five years from now. And as the web improves, as new features come out, right? we want to make sure that you get these things. So we have a very, very clear, stable versioning policy, you know, release policy, we're using semantic versioning, all of this stuff. But that can sometimes make us a little bit constrained in what we can do. One of the interesting things about working on Angular is that you know, people are actually reading and watching the commits and the pull requests that are going on to our GitHub repo all the time. Fairly often, people will blog about a new feature before we've actually merged the pull request, which, can, which is awesome, but can be frustrating, right? Because you get information that kind of isn't out in the world correctly yet. So we started this labs project to kind of put things in a box to say, look, these are things that we're interested in. We're iterating on them. We don't want to be secret about it, right? Everything we do is open source. And so we want to have it out in the wild. But we want to make a clear distinction that these are experimental things. APIs are likely to change or you know, could change. In this case, they probably won't. So don't be too scared about this. But I just want to be upfront with you that this is a project that we are iterating on today. And the reason we're here is because I want to hear from all of you near the end of this. You know, what do you want to do with it? What are things that are challenging today? What things maybe don't make sense? What things do you feel like are missing? And so we can dive into some of that. So as I said, this is kind of the thesis of this. We're really good at building these big, complete applications. But you know, it's a little bit harder to use Angular outside of this kind of SPA model, right? So cases, widgets, right? Things like dashboards. You know, reading these little apps, the Google Calendar embed, right? These sorts of things. SharePoint's a good example of that. Things like CMSs, which again is very much like SharePoint, right? All of these things are outside of this norm of, of kind of doing sort of standard stuff. And really, like if you think about server-side rendering, it's not that different to what I was doing on stage 10 minutes ago, right? Where you're really just laying out some HTML, adding some properties to it, rather than kind of doing this really complex SPA setup. And of course, mixed environments, right? So, Things like Teams who are using both of them. I was at Netflix the other day, and Netflix is used basically every single framework on this list. And of course, this is a SharePoint thing as well, right? It's driven by React. People are writing React components today. We want to make sure that we can play nicely kind of in these environments. We have this problem inside of Google, right? Bunch of teams. We're all using a bunch of different frameworks. One thing you may notice about Google is that Google doesn't always have a consistent sort of this is the way we're doing things. It's a very kind of experimental, free reign sort of place, as you'd expect. And so we end up with teams building sort of the same thing again and again and again. The case that I always like to mention is date pickers. Like, who's built a date picker in this room? A few of you, right? Wouldn't it be nice if you never actually had to build a date picker again? Certainly for me, I feel like that. So again, we want to solve this case for all these teams. Reusable components, date pickers, right? There's 872 of them on NPM. This is the kind of first search that I did. I'm sure there's more like 10,000 out there. Again, back to the reusable component site. So these people are building date pickers, right? But again, you can only use these date pickers kind of in the Angular application. It would be nice if they could use them elsewhere. I don't know why that's doubled. And of course, SharePoint, right? So web part, web component, component, all kind of similar, right? And so to me, it seems like, right, web, you know, SharePoint wants to do this, Angular wants to do this, React wants to do this. Everybody's got a component model. Everybody's got this idea of what a component is. Kind of we've all arrived on the fact that components tend to sort of take input or props or state or whatever you want to call them. They tend to emit events that change the world, right? And this is kind of, to me, is frustrating that we're all kind of rebuilding the world. We're all in our little silos. We're not sharing code. I get to work on an open source team, but really, like, I'd like to go back to, you know, development in the outside world one day and be able to sort of say, we made the web a little bit better, right? 
So as I said, we want to make it better. Can we we're sort of asking this question? And rather than like let's get everybody to use Angular, let's people let people use Angular where it makes sense, mix in where it doesn't. You know, be able to be flexible about this kind of stuff. Enter web components. Who's used web components before? Raise your hand if you've. Well, let's start. Have you heard of web components to start with? It's a fair portion of you. Uh, anybody use them? Nobody. This is going to be exciting. Maybe one person. Cool. <laughs> and so it's clear if you're not using them, you haven't written one, right? So web components are a set of standards that really a bunch of really clever people at a lot of the big browser vendors, I guess it was four or five years ago now, started to basically say the exact thing that I'm saying, right? It's a shame that we're all rebuilding the same stuff over and over again. We're all reinventing the world. Uh, but this is back in the days of sort of Dojo and the original stuff, right? And so they've been thinking about this for a long time. So they propose web component, which is a set of specifications. I'll just jump through them real quick. So HTML templates, right? The ability to be able to basically create a template, stamp it out repeatedly in a performant way. Kind of lets you think about what we call a template in Angular review or whatever. Shadow DOM. This gives you encapsulation. This allows that, you know, that problem that actually you have in SharePoint today, pretty much every big kind of platform has it where you want to have a component, you want to be able to style it, right, in its own custom styling and not have those styles leak all over the page so you don't have to give every single one of your classes, you know, like a 15 character name with a namespace and all these sorts of things. So Shadow DOM is designed to solve that problem. HTML imports, making it easy to load these things, you know, using Webpack in, in SharePoint today or in SPFX today. Uh, there's a bunch of different bundling tools. Basically, nobody likes bundling at all, right? This is not a thing that's fun for anybody, especially us who have to write the bundlers. So HTML imports were designed to solve that. Unfortunately, they didn't really happen. They kind of died out, so we'll forget about this one. This is the one that's really interesting, though, custom elements, right? So the whole kind of idea of what we're all trying to do is basically recreate the DOM, basically recreate what the browser is doing. And we're all sort of faking it in a kind of a very complicated way. And you create an element, and you sort of connect to it. And what a custom element allows you to do is define a new DOM element, right? Something that acts and behaves and effectively is an HTML element for all intents and purposes, except that you can then extend it. You can do it, you know, your own sort of behavior with it. So as I said, it's a custom, it's a standard way to define a web component, create new ones. Uh, we actually looked at this two or three years ago when we started the kind of looking at Angular redesign for the first time. It turns out that really the first version of web components didn't really work for us. They had some issues. And so we gave some feedback to the teams who were iterating on these things. V1 shipped in Chrome six plus months ago. Safari, it landed. Uh, both Edge and Firefox are in the process of implementing it at the moment. It's polyfillable back, right? So these things are not, you know, it's not something that's going to be uh, difficult to use. And you know, if that's not something that works for you, then everything I'm going to show you today, we have a fallback option, which allows you to kind of do it even in you know, IE8. Please don't do it in IE8, but yeah, you can. So this is what you want, right? You want to say, I have a fancy date picker. Use it. Don't think about it. It's encapsulated. And this should bring all the functionality that you want on a page. And if you look at this, right, this is, could be a web part. This could be an Angular component. This could be a DOM element. This could be a React component. This could be Polymer. The idea is, for me, that this shouldn't matter. You should be able to just use this. You know how this works already, because there's a DOM element. So creating a custom element, right? You take a new class. You extend from HTML element. This is the thing you've never been able to do before. Now you can. You can just basically extend HTML element, create a new type. And then you just register it with the browser. So you say custom elements.define, give it a selector, and then pass the class in. And at that point, it is a DOM element. It works. It's got some interesting stuff. So attributes, right? Attributes, being able to kind of give properties to these things, give information to these things, uh, and then basically listen for when this is changing. So we're saying we want to observe the current date attribute and then you know, give us a, a callback function when that actually changes. Use it like this. Ditto for uh, you know, setting these programmatically. You can do this by you know, querying for a thing and then doing set attribute. If you've worked on the web, you probably know how this works already, right? This should not be kind of new. You can do this with jQuery. You can do this with React. Because all of these things, right, they all speak this common language that is the DOM, that is this basic API. Property is the same, right? So you can have setters and getters, and you have a fancy date picker. When we set a property on it, you know, tell us about it. Same thing using it programmatically, right? We can create a picker instance and then go ahead and set a property on it to a new date. Ditto for events, right? We can trigger events to the outside world. So when the date changes and you pick the date picker, right, you can then listen for that date change event from the outside world just by querying for it and logging that date out, right? And then they have lifecycle hooks, right? So you want to know kind of when the thing is connected to the DOM, when it's disconnected from the DOM, when these attributes change, adopted callback. I've never been able to explain adequately, so I'm not even going to try. 
And Angular already supports using custom elements, right? Because Angular just speaks DOM. And so the syntax you use in Angular to speak to custom elements is exactly the same syntax as you use to speak to an input or an Angular component, right? So you actually don't have to know here, is this an Angular component? Is it a custom element? Is it a DOM element? It's consistent. Don't have to think about it. So this is great, right? Why don't we just do everything this way? Why are we using frameworks at all? Why do I work on the Angular team, right? And well, the thing is, is that actually, the catch is that you have to write quite a lot of code to do this in a kind of manual way, right? So this is a very simple kind of checkbox implementation. You can see there's a huge amount of thinking that you really don't want to have to do. You have to think about if attributes are set, then unset them. Keeping properties in sync, it goes on and on, right? So this is why we use frameworks. You don't want to think about all this other stuff. You have problems to solve. You have business logic to do. You want to build widgets. You don't want to build you know, attribute setters and getters. And so Angular, right, the kind of idea of this is that all of these features that we have, all this stuff, forms and routing and HTTP, it would be nice if we could really do both of these things at the same time, right? If we could take all of this power that Angular has, but expose it in such a way that it's, you know, it's basically consumable in any context. Oh, that's in there twice. And so Angular Elements is about that. This is about the idea of, okay, let's take an Angular component and let's just package it as a custom element. Let's wrap it up, ship it up, pack it out, right? One thing I want to point out is that I haven't really talked about SPFX in here much at all, right? Everybody's in here to talk about SPFX. This is why they're using it. But I'm not talking about it at all. And that's sort of on purpose, because really, we're not doing anything special to make this work, right? There are no kind of special affordances in what we're doing for SPFX. SPFX speaks DOM. It uses the browser, right? It understands how elements work. And so if we just kind of conform to the standard, if we spit out this standard type of thing, then anything, including SPFX, should be able to pick it up. So Angular Elements, they're basically self-bootstrapping. If you've tried to do this already, if you're kind of on the bleeding edge of all of these things, this is a really difficult thing to do in Angular today. You kind of have to get a hold of the element. You have to know a bunch of guts of how Angular works. You have to understand a bunch of the APIs. It's not a trivial thing to do. With Angular Elements, with this kind of new way of thinking about it, really, you just put the element on the page. It bootstraps itself. That's it, right? You don't have to do anything else. Uh, we're really, all we're doing is kind of hosting an Angular component, this kind of class that you write, and kind of connecting it to this custom element, this sort of wrapper, if you like. And of course, in Angular, we have all these APIs already inputs, this idea of giving kind of state to a component, and outputs, that's events coming out of the component, right? And then you know, being able to keep these things in sync, so you know, custom elements have things like you know, uh, attributes for IATN, for accessibility. You want to be able to do that in a declarative, kind of simple fashion. And Angular's had this for a while. We're just really kind of gluing the, the pieces together to make this kind of seamless. Uh, if you're an Angular developer today, you know about zones. Uh, zones are kind of this magical thing that we have that allows us to plug into the browser's uh, kind of asynchronous work, so we know when to run change detection. This is great, but again, in things like SPFX, it can be more kind of trouble than it's worth. Angular has just made this optional, so at this point, you can kind of take control. You don't have to worry about using zones at all. So the key takeaway here, right, is that they are Angular components on the inside, consistent standard Angular components. You do anything that Angular does but they're standards based on the outside, right? So we're using a standard, we're not inventing our own thing, and again, because of that, anyone can consume it, because pretty much every web developer in the world knows how they work. So, again, back to this stuff, right? So I wanna show you, this is kind of a, a custom element that's a progress bar. So a very, very simple progress bar. There's a lot of code here, again, at the bottom to sort of get a hold of the thing and query for the selector and you know, keep the, the things up in sync. This is the same exact thing implemented at Angular, right? So the template's a little bit simpler because we're just using data binding there. You can see line 21, we're doing a host binding, which is basically when this value kind of changes, keep that thing in sync, right? So when the progress changes, we'll keep that, that area val value attribute in sync. This is for accessibility. These are things that you want to get right, right? Accessibility is pretty important to us. So this makes it really easy without having to think about how do I keep these things in sync? This is a declarativeness. And then if you look at you know, a web part, this is just like the kind of generated out of the box web part. Again, it's pretty similar, right? We've basically just got this, this sort of block of code. We want to do templating on it. In this case, we're just doing kind of string concatenation. But really, like, they're pretty similar, right? So kind of native custom element, Angular component, and web part. And so we got thinking about this, and it was like, well, you know, why don't we just kind of merge these things together? I actually built a demo out of web parts sort of six months ago, and it was, it was functional, it worked, but it was actually really, really complicated. 
I could not have explained it to you on this stage at all. And so we sort of put it on the back burner. And really, this kind of custom elements idea has been baking you know, in, our, in, our, in our ovens for a little while. And then when we sort of came up with the thing three months ago that we really liked, we just kind of looked back at the SharePoint case that we talked about a year ago and went, oh, really, this solves it, right? This makes it really, really easy to do. So Angular Elements inside of SharePoint, right? So it's just the kind of reactive Angular model where things are getting set from the outside world. Ability to use the full Angular platform. They're simple to consume. Uh, I started out talking about web parts. Somebody told me on Monday when I got here, clearly I am not a SharePoint developer, right? Somebody told me extensions. Well, you can do the same thing. Custom controls, we should be able to do the same way. So there's a bunch of really interesting stuff we think we can do inside of, of SharePoint just using this kind of consistent thing. And the other thing is that anything that we're going to do for this Angular integration works for anybody else who's doing custom elements, doing Polymer, doing web components, doing Aurelia, doing any of these things. As long as they speak DOM, then anything we do to make kind of the, the SPFX Angular experience better should actually make the experience better for everybody, which is nice. So do a couple of demos real quick. Um, let's just jump over to here. I'm going to just do a couple of short demos, kind of expand on the things that I did uh, earlier in the keynote. And then really what I just want to do is open the floor up to you, because I, you know, I don't really know the right way to do things. So I'm curious to know, what's the right things you want to see? Do you have questions about this? Are there things that you've tried and kind of you, know, you don't, want to, don't want to do the hard way? So let's jump back over to this graph demo, and hopefully this will work this time. Yep, OK, let's start the server. Sorry, oh, I came off stage in a bit of a flutter. Let's see. Cool. So uh, this I've just actually put, pushed up to GitHub, so you're welcome to just pull it in and play with it. Let's get my right profile going here. And we'll do a gulp. Sorry. Hooray. Look in here. Go ahead and add our graph demo. And hooray, we're actually talking to, oh my god, thank you, it works. <laughs> cool, so how are we doing this? Let's jump into that a little bit deeper. So in this case, right, let's just do this top to bottom. We're bringing in kind of the Angular standard stuff, components and modules and inputs. Bringing in the browser module, this kind of allows Angular to run in the browser. Bringing in the common module, which gives us things like ng4 and ngif. Uh, just bringing in kind of the straight web part types, right? So this is the, the SP web part package. We're just using the web part context type from there. Again, all these types, graph HTTP client, all these things, these come from the SharePoint side. We're not doing anything special for them for Angular because, again, we're just speaking TypeScript. They're speaking TypeScript. Everything kind of works. Um, start with the selector here, right? So the selector declares kind of how it's going to be used in the DOM. Template. So the templates you can do in line. We can actually do them this way, and we can say templates. Do this one. I could do exactly the same stuff inside of this inline template. Uh, one of the big kind of early philosophies of Angular was that we want people who maybe not be full-on programmers to be able to contribute, right? If you have really good designers, you have people who are doing CSS in a really, really good way. And I am terrible at CSS, so I'm thankful that people can do this. Um, you know, we can use standard HTML templates, standard SCSS, or standard SAS, standard stylus, whatever you want to do. Um, and Angular's job is to kind of munge all this stuff together and give you this kind of functional unit, right? Uh, just show you the template real quick, as I said. Graph demo, we're doing our ng4s, just a little bit of data, data binding. Uh, one of the things I just want to point out here, uh, inside of kind of a standard, and this is just straight copy and pasted from, from the kind of newly generated thing, right? Typically, you'd have to do kind of scoping yourself here, right? So you're basically saying, this is the Hello World container. Everything inside of that, right? Then we're going to kind of locally scope these. And this is, again, so you're not going to kind of bleed these styles over the page. You're not going to leak the styles out of your component. You want to make sure that you can do that in, in a way that's kind of idiomatic, right? And so actually inside of Angular, one of the things that is built into our compiler is that we will do that for you kind of automatically. So actually, you could just skip this entire step of kind of wrapping it and be able to just kind of do completely standard CSS without thinking about scoping, without worrying about leaking. And Angular will either emulate that for you or use that shadow DOM feature that I was talking about to actually go ahead and do that. Let me just show you what that looks like real quick. So if you wanted to turn on native shadow DOM and do kind of full on native browser style encapsulation, that's as simple as just saying, like, use the native version, right? Because Angular is a compiled framework, we do all this at build time on the server. You're not paying the cost of scoping CSS or anything you know, actually in the client. 
This is all done at build time, so you get really nice, fast, performant components on the way out. Uh, let's change that back to none. Cool. So just a couple of things I want to point out here. So one of the things that we're big on on the, on the Angular team is RxJS, right? We're not using it here at all because this is promise-based. Angular doesn't care. You can use promises or observables. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're not doing any unwrapping here. So like, notice I'm not sort of unwrapping the groups thing and telling it to change detect. We're just telling Angular, look, this thing is a promise. We look at the template. It's asynchronous. It's a promise. It's going to come back from the server at some point when it comes back from the server. Go ahead and just render this list of groups for me. And I'm gonna, you get that kind of type completion in there, which is really nice. This was a ridiculous amount of effort to get it to work, but I think it's just an incredible feature to be able to use HTML really in a way that is, is really, really powerful with IntelliSense. This is what people love about JSX, right? JSX is something that allows you to do this in line in JavaScript. And for people who love JavaScript and embrace JavaScript, and I am one, JSX is great, but it's really, really nice for us to be able to get the same exact kind of functionality, that type checking, all that stuff that's nice in kind of straight, pure HTML, right? You don't have to think about JSX. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. So this means that you could hand this template to a competent designer, an HTML person, a CSS person, and they can enhance this. They can work with it. They don't really have to know anything about how it works. It's declarative. Over here. Cool. A couple of things to point out. So I've talked a lot about components, right, uh, as a kind of standalone unit. Angular has this concept that's a little bit higher level than a component. We call it an ng module. We kind of think about it, I like to think about it as an app, right? And one of the big things in Angular is dependency injection, right? This idea of being able to do testing, being able to bring in dependencies simply by injecting them. With a standalone component, kind of in the React model, we don't really have this idea of dependency injection. Um, we can actually do it really trivially in here. This actually works completely compatible with Angular elements. So if I wanted to say, like, class, my data service, it's going to go out to the server. I'm just going to say this is an injectable. Hopefully that's going to say, go ahead and import it. Cool. And I can just bring in this data service, add it to a list of providers. This makes it available to the injector, right, to the kind of application injector, my data service in here. And then I can just go into the component constructor. I just say I'm going to inject a instance of my data service. that up. Classes don't hoist. So at this point, right, we get this data service. What did I call that data service? Uh, export it. So, you know, at this point, we write code that could go fetch stuff from graph API. And then we can just jump back into our class here and do something like, you know, data dot fetch stuff from the graph API. So again, the whole idea here is this is kind of the full power of Angular um, without really having to think any differently about it. It's just a different way of packaging it. It's just a different way of kind of exporting the, the component that you're writing. Um, I was talking to a bunch of different people this week. I had a lot of really, really interesting conversations. Um, and one of the things that we mentioned is that right, if you're doing SharePoint and right, you're building front-end applications, you might have a website, you might have an internal you know, an application you're, you're selling to your customers, this allows you to kind of really just write one language, one kind of idea, one set of tools, one set of knowledge, and be able to use it in a whole bunch of different places. And I think, for me, that's why this is so interesting, right? Is that we want people to be productive, we want people to build what they need to build without having to think too much about it, right? That's our whole idea of Angular, is just to make your lives productive um, without having to learn 15 different things, right? Learn Angular, and we can do it on the mobile, we can do it server, we can do it SharePoint, we can kind of package it up and put it wherever we want. And I think that's a really pretty powerful and important concept. Let's just jump back over here. So, what are we going to do next? Uh, Angular Elements, this is a, this experimental project. We're going to land it uh, in the Angular 5 release cycle. Angular does uh, six months. So we have a six-month kind of major release cycle. Uh, previous versions always backwards compatible with the kind of the next version. Um, so Angular Elements should land probably in the next couple of months. That may be a little bit longer. Again, it's a labs project. Um, but everything we've thrown at it so far, it seems to handle pretty well. Uh, I've started up a GitHub org here. This is going to be, uh, for us, kind of the, the central place that we want people to kind of come and chat about this. Uh, again, the whole reason Angular works at all is because we have this amazing, amazing community of people, right? Uh, we really want the, the community to drive this. We're here to support that, right? But we are, again, the not the right people to tell you how to build extensions, how to build web parts. We want to give you these kind of powerful tools 
and support you in order very possible. And again, if there's something that doesn't make sense here, or there's something that really like, you know, maybe we don't have the right mental model, then please let us know. We'd like to know that. Um, and again, the, the SPFX team has been really awesome to work with. So we have a bunch of different things that I've, you know, as the kind of the, the course of developing these demos over the past couple of weeks and kind of figuring out how to plug everything together. Uh, I've got a whole list of things that we're gonna go back to with the SPFX team and kind of work with to kind of try to plug some of these things together in a way that's a little bit easier to use. Uh, eventually, and quite quickly, we'd like to get to a point where you can just do, you know, yo Microsoft SharePoint and get Angular as one of the options in the dropdown and get this kind of out for free. A um, couple of things to think about. So uh, I know there's a kind of set of Fabric React components. Uh, they're pretty super awesome. I was using them the other day to kind of get a feel for how this works. I would really like to see, uh, you know, the people who have used Angular, the ng Office UI, or ng, yes, you know, the Angular version that exists today. Uh, I'd like to be able to see that in Angular in the new version. Um, and we should be able to make that much, much easier, right, with our kind of component development kit. We're going to give you most of the hard work. And really, all we need is a few people who are much better at CSS than I am to kind of integrate these things right on top of these kind of existing Angular-based components. I said we want to integrate and streamline the build and the compile and the deploy. Um, we'll do a Yo integration. The other thing that's pretty interesting is that Angular has this CLI, right? Build tools suck. Everybody hates JavaScript build tooling. So we've decided that we write this Angular CLI, which does you know, code generation and build and test, and it does, you know, scaffolding and templating, and it's a really, really powerful framework. Everybody tends to love it, um, but it's, again, it's been, always been very opinionated. So one of the things that we sort of added fairly recently here is Angular schematics. Schematics are kind of our take on Yeoman, if you like. Um, I'm going to try and convince the SPFX team to take that, but I don't think they're going to. Um, but what we'd like to actually see is a, you know, a set of these kind of web part schematics. So you have a web part schematic, maybe an extension schematic, a custom control schematics. Again, this can be community driven. Please, please reach out to me. This is Debrel at Angular.io. Um, and we get you in contact with the right people. I would really love to see you know, all the people who are in this room are interested, be able to kind of get together, have a chat about what's the right way to do this. What things do we need? What things do, you know, does Angular need to provide? What things does the CDK need to provide to you? and really give you a really powerful base kind of set of tools to work with to build this stuff. So here's some links, take a snapshot of this. Uh, right now it's on our kind of labs branch on the, the main Angular repo. You can pull it down and play with it by kind of doing npm install Angular elements, uh, build command there. Uh, we've just added that SPFX hello world uh, kind of demo. I've just pushed that up just before the keynote. You can pull that down, play with it again, uh, experimental, but any problems, whatever, open an issue, we can talk through it. Read about web components on webcomponents.org. Uh, these two links down at the bottom, these are really, really good, super introductory tutorials to uh, Angular and or just to be custom elements and Shadow DOM, these two ideas I was talking about. It's worth learning about these two things, even if you were saying to me, I'm never going to use Angular ever again. Please go read about these base things because not just Angular is doing this, right? I think we've talked to the Ember team a little bit about this. Polymer is already doing this. The React team is working on their integration with web components to make them a little more seamless to actually use web components inside of, you know, inside of JSX. So I'm at the point where I feel like the kind of the web has realized the error of our ways, right? Maybe we should all stop writing the same dip picker again and again and again. Um, and I think custom elements and, and web components and Shadow DOM will really become the kind of foundational layers for the next generation of stuff we build. Uh, as it has been super cool working with the SPFX team to, to make all this work, I've learned a huge amount in the past week or so. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to say thanks uh, to the SPFX team and Andrew Connell, I'm sure a lot of you know him. He's been super instrumental with sitting with me. He flew out to Mountain View, sat down for two hours and first of all explained to me what SharePoint was, how it worked, how you guys think about it. Uh, and so that's been super awesome uh, for me to learn about and so I'm super, super appreciative of that. That's me, that's the end. Um, I think we've got plenty of time even though we fooled around at the beginning there for a little bit. So. I would love to open up for questions, comments, concerns, abuse, if you prefer. Um, yeah, so that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> comments, concerns, questions? Somebody surely has got a question. Is no? At any point, will it be, for people uh, like myself, who are stuck on older versions of SharePoint, the idea that everything's only ever going to work with the new SPFX, or can we? No, not at all. This is one of the cases that we mentioned early on there, is that if you're in a browser, this will work, right? So kind of the integration we're showing here is sort of tightly integrated and nicely coupled, right? But all you really have to do is get the script tag in the page. So in the same way, if you've been doing, you know, kind of the old style of SharePoint development and you're using jQuery to build widgets, right? 
you drop a script tag into the page. This works exactly the same way. All you have to do is get that element registered in the browser. You know, you could render it on the server in your, on your you know, SharePoint side, and then when the browser boots up, it will go ahead and make that interactive. So that's, that's a case that absolutely want to make sure it works. And that's very similar to, you know, if you're using it in Drupal or CMS. Very similar kind of mental model for that. So yeah, for sure it should work in that model. Yeah? What's the release date for? So as I said, it'll be in our, in our release five cycle. So that's uh, some point in the next six months. I would like to see it kind of just after Christmas. Um, one of the nice things about this is that really what's, what will change, if anything, is the glue layer, right? We're not changing the Angular API. And of course, there's a standard API, right, that exists. So really, I would reason that it's a fairly reasonable thing to start playing with today. I wouldn't say go ship it in production tomorrow, right? Um, but in the next couple of months, I'd expect to see kind of the first versions of elements come out, and then it should be a stable release. We'll put it onto the same version cycle as Angular. Um, we'll add to it, we'll augment it, we'll learn some more stuff. There's a lot of things in Angular we'd like to do to improve this even further, but we reckon we can get the kind of the base implementation of this out in the next couple of months. So maybe 5.2 of Angular. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what's the deal with AOT? Uh, with AOT and CLI and all that kind of stuff. Cool. So uh, AOT, for anybody who doesn't know, so Angular has this idea that we have, you know, you take HTML and CSS and we compile it ahead of time into this kind of JavaScript binary, if you like. Um, so that's been the thing that's been really challenging before we got to this point. Um, we actually have it kind of integrated in here. So you're actually on my list of people to talk about about this. Um, I'll just show you down in here just so you can kind of see under the covers of what's actually happening here. So it's just a little bit of Webpack config. I've got our ng tools Webpack plug running inside of the kind of normal SharePoint dev cycle here. Uh, and all I've really done is actually kind of turn off the standard TypeScript build because Angular does that for you, right? And so it's just, that's like literally all the setup that exists today. I have a little note to myself here that says just factor this out into an NPM package. So it, you know, it should be able as simple as something like, I don't know, you know, configure NGC and just pass the build object into it. We'll do something along those lines. Um, but yeah, it, it all works. AOT is in there. No JIT. Like I have not used kind of the just the just in time compiler at all. So that is already AOT. Yeah, this is all already AOT. Uh, you can actually you can tell that I'm doing that. There's a one way to sort of understand that. Let's see. I've got my index file. I'm actually pulling in the compiled ng factory here, right? And so. Angular, when it goes through our chips compiler, it says, oh, cool, we need to actually generate this code for us, right? And so this is kind of the, the compiled outputs uh, from Angular. This runs instantly. The kind of, there's no boot up process. There's no fetching resources. If you're an AngularJS developer, you know, you've done that gulp task where you can get all your templates and kind of concat them together and ship them. This obviates the need for that uh, and does all the work that AngularJS does at runtime right now, kind of offloads that to the server, which again means much, much smaller bundles, much, much faster components, much more performance stuff. Other questions? Cool. Uh, so that's really it for me. I'm probably a little, little bit early at this point, but maybe that's good. Um, please, I'll just hang out here if you want to come and chat with me privately. If you've got use cases, ideas, whatever, please come and speak to me. We want to hear exactly what it is you want to do. Uh, and thanks for listening. <laughs>